All right, hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about how Akadana actors restart. And specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about how the actor life cycle built into Akadana actors helps us build more resilient, fault tolerant .NET applications. So, as you may recall from Akadana Bootcamp, all Akadana actors are organized into a parent child hierarchy, beginning with the user guardian actor, which is built into the framework. And then next we have your top level actors, which are the parent one and parent two actors on this diagram. Then we have a layer of children. One of the important roles the hierarchy plays is the concept of parental supervision. When a child actor throws an unhandled exception, its parent is notified automatically about how that child failed. A parent can then decide how it wants to treat that child upon receiving notification about that failure. And the default behavior, which is a really good choice, is to simply restart that actor and reboot it back into its original, well-known, safe state. What we're going to talk about in this video is what actually happens when an actor restarts, and what are some of the implications that this has on your Akadana applications. Now, one of the biggest benefits of using the actor model is the fact that actors provide a really high degree of fault isolation inside your applications. So this means that when exceptions are thrown, they're always contained inside the actor who threw them. So there's not going to be any side effects anywhere else in the actor hierarchy. One actor crashing can't cause another actor to crash, in other words. On top of that, actor failures are explicitly handled by the supervision model. So parent actors get to decide what happens when children fail. And this can be programmed via setting a custom supervision strategy if you want. So parents can do things like reboot an actor, which is the default. We can resume an actor, which is the same as just discarding the exception and processing more messages without restarting. Or we can kill the actor, which permanently shuts it down. And in some cases, we can escalate an exception to a grandparent if we want. So this means that the parent treats its child's failure as its own and kicks the exception upstairs to the grandparent. This is useful for triggering rolling restarts if you want. Now, speaking of restarts, one of the amazing properties of actors in Akka.net is that restarts are transparent to all the other callers from the outside. So actor references that point to actors who restarted are totally unaffected by restarts. Essentially, a restart operation is an internal implementation detail to an actor. So when an actor restarts, it's going to go through a process of running through its life cycle methods again, rehydrating some of its state possibly, and then it'll resume processing all the messages that were in its mailbox. So none of the content that that actor hadn't processed yet gets lost when an actor restarts. Let's take a closer look at what the actor lifecycle looks like, both in code and in concept. So this is your standard receive actor. And a receive actor has a number of receive methods that you usually define in one of its behaviors or inside a constructor. But then the rest of the methods on this actor are the lifecycle methods. First, we have the pre-start method, which is used to provide some initialization code when this actor first runs. A pre-restart method, which gets invoked right before this actor restarts. This is where we can do things like pass our stash back into the mailbox, or try to handle the message that caused us to throw this exception one last time before we begin our restart. And then we have the post-stop method, which usually contains cleanup code of some kind. And then in some cases, we might also want to have a post restart method, a special method that gets called on the brand new actor instance we're going to create whenever an actor gets rebooted. So we begin in the starting phase where the actor initializes, calls pre start, and allocates any objects it might need to do its work when it processes messages. Next, we have our happy place, the receiving stage. This is where we go and process messages and do our normal work. And this is where actors spend most of their life. However, we might enter a stopping phase when we're going to be terminated or when we need to restart. And that's when we begin cleaning up. If we are going to restart, we're going to go ahead and go through this whole phase all over again. And this all happens internally inside the actor. And you can see with some of the annotations here, here's where the various lifecycle methods kick in. We call pre-start when we initialize. We call post-stop when we're shutting down but we might also call post stop right after we call pre restart if we're going to go through a restart inside this actor. And then finally, before we call pre start, if the actor is going to reboot, we'll also call post restart. 
So this is the life cycle that Akadana actors have. Now, what's important to know is what are all the actual components inside an actor and what do they do during these life cycle stages? So if we're gonna talk about what restarts do, we need to understand how actors are organized in the first place. So the first part of an actor is the actor class that you program. That's the actor on this diagram here. Well, what actually makes an actor work in a real Akadana application is the actor cell, which sits behind it. The actor cell is something you can access through the context property when you're working with your actor. The actor cell contains all of the parts that make the actor. The actor's mailbox, for instance, is created by the actor cell. The props that were used to start this actor are stored by the actor cell. And the actor cell also registers the mailbox with the dispatcher. The dispatcher is the group of threads that actually cause the actor to process the messages inside its mailbox. And then there's the actor reference, which actually points to the actor cell and not your actor class directly. So when we tell a message to an actor reference, what actually happens is, is we push that message to the actor cell. The actor cell then causes that message to get enqueued inside the mailbox. And then the mailbox will schedule itself with the dispatcher to say, I have messages that need to process and this actor needs to execute. At some point in the future, the executor will begin running this actor's mailbox processing routine. And that'll cause messages to be pushed from inside the actor's mailbox into the actor's receive methods. And this is how an actor actually processes its messages. When an actor restarts as a result of a crash, here's what actually happens. Let's suppose this actor was processing a message and that message had a null property in it that caused this actor to throw a null reference exception. What will happen is the actor cell will automatically report this failure back to this actor's parent. That parent will issue a decision on how to handle this child's failure, and by default, that's going to be a restart directive. What the actor cell is going to do is it's going to garbage collect the current instance of the actor that you programmed. So we're going to go ahead and destroy it and tear it down. All of the actor's internal state will be wiped out, but none of the messages in the actor's mailbox will be lost. That's because they're housed inside a separate data structure that is distinct from the actor. What will happen next is, we're going to use the prompts that you used to originally start this actor to help us create a brand new instance of that actor. And then we're going to begin pushing the rest of the unprocessed messages in that actor's mailbox into that brand new actor instance. So this is how actor restarts can be transparent from the outside. It's because the swapping out and destruction of that old actor instance is completely self-contained inside the actor cell. So any messages that are still being sent to that iActor ref are still going to be queued inside the actor's mailbox. We're just going to be swapping out the instance of the actor that actually processes them. And this actor will go through its pre-start routine and everything else that it needs to in order to get fully initialized and to be able to resume processing of these messages all over again. So based on the internal structure of how actors work, let's review what gets lost and what doesn't when an actor restarts. So the most valuable thing that gets lost is the in-memory actor state. This is because we're destroying the old actor instance. Therefore, any fields and properties you assigned are also going to get garbage collected. However, it's pretty easy to go and build in some recovery mechanisms inside the pre-start method. That's what persistent actors do, for instance, is they replay their state from the database when they get recreated again after a crash. The other thing that may get lost is the current message. Now, you do have an opportunity to handle this message one last time via pre-restart, but you're not going to find that message inside your mailbox again. And as a best practice, the right thing to do may be to just simply log this message and the type of exception that it threw, because this exception may have been thrown as a result of something inside the message itself that may have been malformed. So you may not want to actually handle it again. Now, any messages that you've stashed using the stash built into Akka.net, those are all part of the actor state. So those will get lost as well. But one thing you can do during pre-restart, and this is really common, is simply unstash all those messages back into the mailbox. That'll move those messages out of the actor's state and back into the actor's mailbox again, which won't be affected by the restart. Now, one very important implication of actor restarts is the initial safe state of an actor is childless by default. 
So all of your child actors will be killed by default when you restart. And this is typically why parent actors aren't given risky work. Risky meaning things that can throw exceptions. However, if you do have child actors and you're worried about needing to restart, one of the things you can do is override the pre-restart method and simply not call base.pre-restart. That'll override this behavior and allow children to survive between their parents' restarts. So that behavior is customizable. Now, in terms of what doesn't get lost during a restart, any of the actor's unprocessed messages will be left intact because they all reside in the mailbox, which isn't part of the actor class instance itself. And on top of that, any of the original constructor arguments that you pass into your actor, those values will persist across restarts because they're all contained inside that props class, which also isn't affected by restarts. And then any other piece of actor cell data, such as being able to access the scheduler, being able to access your parent, none of that data is ever affected by a restart. So some of the big implications of the fact that actors can restart in isolation, and we can customize the rules on how actors restart, is that this gives us the ability to have simple, understandable, and predictable failure handling behavior at runtime. What a lot of developers do with traditional object-oriented code is they write what I like to call dig out code, where they try to back their way out of an exception through a bunch of intricate try-catch blocks and the like. Just letting an actor crash and revert back to a well-known safe state is a much more testable default way of handling errors than this. This allows us to simply reboot parts of our application back to its initial state, and then we can go ahead and get it back to whatever its next state was using mechanisms like Aqueduct Persistence. So this gives us the ability to build really resilient code that can reboot anytime it gets corrupted by a bad message or bad user input. On top of that, restarts give us the ability to preserve any previously sent and unprocessed messages. So we don't have to worry about managing sender state or anything else. The fact that restarts are resilient and isolated internal implementation details gives us a lot of flexibility in how we allow affected parts of our system to recover from failures. The next really powerful bit about the restart model in Aka.net is that the supervision model can allow for rolling restarts. So let's suppose you have an entire area of your application that all depends on some external resource being available. Well, if that resource goes offline and all of those actors underneath the area of the hierarchy are gonna fail, we can go ahead and reboot all of those actors and wait for them to go and reconnect to that resource again. And that way we can go ahead and essentially have a self-healing system that way. This is a technique that we use internally in the Aka.net project in areas like Aka.net Remote, for instance. It allows us to go and garbage collect any socket connections and anything else we might have been using to service multiple remote hosts. Aka.net's resiliency and failure models are really robust, and we'd really encourage you to go and play around with those inside your own applications. And if you're looking for some more resources on how to get better with Aka.net, please check out the official documentation or the Pettibridge blog, where we have lots more tutorials and content just like this that might help you in your journey with Aka.net. Thank you.